a new book today in the series that we've been going through, the books of the Bible. John, would you mind just increasing the volume of this mic? My voice is a little down. As we are going to turn to the book of Deuteronomy, I want to read a flyer, um, a flyer, uh, uh, a meeting that is going to be happening next Saturday morning, 9.30 a.m. at this church. Uh, it's just uh, we're going to be only a few members uh, it's, uh, or a few people that come. And the, it's a leadership training uh, for Ignite student leaders, uh, basically student leaders who want to train up middle schoolers and also Sunday school teachers. Uh, this would be a very beneficial meeting or a training session for you. It's going to be like a seminar. We're going to be talking about legal and ethical issues in youth ministry. You know, anything to do with social media or any other aspects that come within your, your, your you know, when you are talking to middle schoolers. Uh, also Christian leadership and also identifying issues in, in middle schoolers. So it, it will be a very, uh, very nice thing if, if, uh, if anybody is interested to become a student leader or you're already part of the student, student leadership or any of the Sunday school teachers, if you are, uh, if you're, you know, this will be really beneficial. So I encourage all of you to come. It will start at 9.30 a.m. Uh, in this church uh, and it will only last till the afternoon. So we will have the night, uh, nighttime uh, meeting here as well. So only in the morning. So only, uh, you know, who are able, please do come. All right, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. I thank God that God has given us this opportunity to once again come and, uh, and, and, and uh, worship Him and praise Him. Truly, truly He is worthy, not just in songs, you know, our, our, our whole life should have this, this, this constant theme that because my God is worthy, I'm able to do all of this. And I'm saying these things because my God is worthy. I'm doing these things because my God is worthy. I'm thinking these things because my God is worthy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 6, uh, uh, 6 to perhaps just 8. The Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb. Horeb saying, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn, set your journey, go to the hill country of Amorites, to all their neighbors in the Arabah, in the hill country and in the lowland and in the Negev and by the sea coast. The land of Canaanites and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have placed the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to them and their descendants after them. All right. So a new book. Deuteronomy. Basically, it is called a second law. He gives the law a second time. You see a lot of repetitions in this book. Things that were mentioned in Exodus, things that were mentioned in Numbers. He repeats this in this book. God repeats. One thing that we can learn when we come to this book is, don't be afraid of repetition. It's okay when somebody repeats something. It's okay. God wants to deliver that message. That is why. Amen. You know, we, uh, we are in a culture of sorts. Our greatest criticisms about ministers could be, there is only one message or one type of message that this person has. Don't be afraid of that because the prophets in the old also kind of had only one message. The, the gospels, if you read, is a bunch of repetition. If you were to take the example of Jesus, he kind of only had one message. The kingdom of God. It was a repetition. We always want something exciting because we want to feed our soul. But God is in the business of feeding our spirit. What is going to be, what is needful is what he wants to deliver. What is needful. And I'm not saying there is no creativity or anything in God. Absolutely, God is a very creative God. But you see, there shouldn't be, we should not be afraid of repetitions. And this is what you see in this book as well, repetition. Deuteronomy, in other words, in Greek, is, is basically a second law. Right? Then we need to ask ourselves, why was this law given a second time? Why was this law given a second time? And the, and the reason is this. 
when he gave the law the first time, that generation is now all gone. They're all destroyed in the wilderness. It's now to the those folks who weren't born, those folks who were little children at that time, now they have gone, become an adult. Now God is giving them another, or, or the same law, and he is having another, or, or telling them, I am going to have a personal relationship with you. Amen. All right, so this is, this is the point of this, though. God is not like a grandfather. You just don't inherit what my parents did. You get what I'm saying? Because my parents received the law, because my parents had a connection with God, oh, I can also join into the group. That's not how it works. God wants to have a personal encounter with you, wants to give you a personal encounter. That's why he had to give the law the second time. He had to have a connection with this generation. The old generation received something from God that is good and well, but this generation, I want to come a new way. I want to have a connection with you. That is why what they saw, the splitting of the Red Sea, I'm going to give you something similar. You will be able to see the Jordan split in front of you. God needs to become real for you as well. So that you won't say, my, my daddy's God. No, you will say, my God and my Lord. What a privilege it is, young children. You and I need to have a direct connection with God. The book of Deuteronomy proves that. He himself wants to have a relationship, a personal relationship with you. That's why a child who does not understand God, does not understand the law of God, cannot ever be baptized and be joined to God and by saying my parents or some godfather or godmother is going to take my responsibility. No, it is a personal connection. It's a personal connection, you understand. Why then you see why baptism is so important only when you understand and you are ready to take on this relationship moving forward with God. It is your own personal responsibility. He gave the law a second time in the border, in the border of that promised land. Now, worse, I think it's worse too. Yeah, it is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea is entering the promised land in 11 days. From where they first received the law, it was just 11 days. But they were stuck in this Horeb for 38 years. Can you imagine, just for a moment, think about this. Put yourself in, your, in that shoes. Here is God's elect, chosen, God's blessed. God's blessed and the journey is only 11 days. The promise is only 11 days away. But this group of people are stuck there for 40 years within the wilderness. Some pastor has given an example like this. You know, a, 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 a student can finish 12th grade by the normal age of 18, but there might be some who will take about 25, 26 years just to finish high school. It's up to us. It's up to us. There is a common phrase that you will see in this book, and it's this. The land that the Lord gives you. The Lord has given you this land. The Lord has given you this opportunity. The Lord has given you all of this. Now, there is at the same token, the same number of time, this phrase is also written, go in and possess it. Not only that the Lord has given you this, but go in and possess it. You know, God has given us promises, but it is our job to go in and possess it as well. It is our job. Do we want to go possess it in 11 days? Or it's, it's going to be our deal if you only want to just wait around and wait around and wait around and let years go pass by. My friends, it doesn't have to be because God has promised, this is the land that I want to give you. Go in and possess it. God is not a partial God. He is not. He doesn't have some favorites about you know one group and another group that he's not his favorite. No, God is a promise-keeping God. He has no favorites. He's not a partial God. What God has done for them, God will do for you. Then you and I need to ask for ourselves, why are they more successful than me? 
Why are they able to inherit much more of God's promises than me? Why are their marriages reflecting God's glory than mine? You have to ask yourself, God, is it your fault or is it mine? God, you have given me these promises. I need to just go in and possess it. Seriously, we need to ask ourselves. We might be in the brink of the promise of God. We might be in the brink of the victory of God. God has given us. Why are we not able to possess it? What is holding us back? Those things need to be addressed. Let this book, as we go through this book, let those things be addressed in our life. Just for example, perhaps there is a family. This marriage, we know what God has told about marriages or family life in the Bible. It could be the most beautiful thing. Ephesians, Paul says, the love between a husband and wife is the love that Christ has for the church. Oh, what an amazing representation in this world. If there is one relationship that can represent the love that church or the Christ has for the church is a marital relationship, a marital covenantal relationship. Then we need to ask ourselves, does my marriage show that? Why then, if it is not showing, why then? Why then are others having a much more successful marital life? Why then are they leading much more of a victorious Christian life? Why am I not able to possess it? Is there a lack of faith in my end? My friends, God has promised us. That means God will equip us to get that promise. You understand? He is not just going to say, go ahead and do your thing. He has equipped us, strengthened us. Let us go and possess it. You got to have a desire, you see. You got to have a desire. He, looking at, you know, committing the sin, starts to blame Adam. Adam starts to blame Eve. I mean, it was just, just a whole mess of things before 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 anything unfolded they are placing the blames on others they are placing the blame on the environments but you see this first sin when it entered the world while they are blaming busy blaming each other this man of god this son of man who was slain before all mankind who committed no sin you see he takes on the blame of everyone why are we able not to enter into that promised land what God has promised? Is it because we are pinpointing it to every, every other fault but except for mine? Every other's problem except for mine? Everybody else's issues except for mine? My friend, if it's up to you, that means it's up to you how much of God's promises you can have. It's up to you how much of God's promises you are able to inherit. It's up to you how much of a victorious Christian life you and I can enjoy. Some of us lead the most miserable Christian life because we don't have come to this promised land. We have not come and acquired what God has promised. I was just talking in my Sunday school. Can you imagine for a moment Jesus ever being depressed? Jesus getting up in the morning and saying, Ah, oh, uh, what a blah kind of day. But, uh, can you imagine him ever going through that struggle? Can you imagine Jesus ever being angry and not being able to, or, or, or keeping that anger or bitterness in his heart? Can you imagine Jesus ever lying to anybody? Can you imagine Jesus ever being proud about anything? That is the life that God can give us. What God did for Christ, he will do for me as well. That's the good news of the New Testament, the New Covenant. What he did for Jesus, he will do for me as well. Amen. That is the promise, the attitude that Jesus, let this be attitude be in you, just like in Christ Jesus. Amen. The attitude that was in Christ Jesus, let that be in you this week. Amen. This week. Amen. Where all did the attitude of Christ just boom out? In my workplace, when somebody, when somebody didn't do their job and I had to go fill for them, did the attitude of Christ just boom out? In my house, when my parents, oh, laughing. In my house, when my mom and dad called me for something, 
Did my attitude of Christ just boom out, just reflect? When my husband or when my wife had a disagreement with me, did the love of Christ that has been engulfed in my heart that I proclaim, did that just boom out? It did. It really did. It did. I wrote a letter about it too. <laughs> did the attitude, you, you understand, we, we read this and we don't, don't have a practical aspect. The attitude of Jesus Christ in my every phone call, for a time I think about it, every phone call, every Every time there was a group of people, it was the attitude of Christ that was being reflected. You know, when we were hanging out in that dining table, in that, you know, right before that prayer group, there is a little samsara, and right after the prayer meeting, there is a little samsara, it was the attitude of Christ still. It was the attitude of Christ that was just reflected. Praise God. God has promised what he has done for Christ. He will do for me. Then we need to ask ourselves, do I want such a life? Do I want my marriage to be a success like the Bible says? Do I want my Christian life to be the victorious one that Bible says? Do I want my church to be a one that reflects the glory of God like the Bible says? Or do I want what I have right now? Your answer to that question will determine how much of the land you are able to possess. Your answer to the question, what God has given me, what God has promised me, this loving God who gave his only son for me, what he has promised, how much I am able to get and enter in, it's going to be up to me. God has given us this land, praise God. It is our job to go and possess it. For the constraints of time, I'm going to end it here. We'll continue on in this book, Job, in which you just lead us aloud in prayer.